Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa yusalli wa yusallam ala sayyidil awwaleen wal akhirin Nabiyyana Muhammadan wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa barak wa sallam All praise are due to Allah, Lord of the world and peace and blessings be upon constant your beloved Prophet Muhammad the master of the first and the last and his family, his companions and all those who call to his way and establish his sunnah to the day of judgment as to what follows, my beloved brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again for the opportunity to be in the month of Ramadan and to have existed with this month uh, till the middle. We are in the middle days uh, of this blessed sacred time. And the concept of imsak, som, the concept of fasting, has been with us for a number of days. And this is important uh, for us now as we are getting more used, used to it physically, that we um, really reflect upon what we are doing. Because it is reported that the Prophet ﷺ said on one occasion, مَنْ لَمْ يَدَعْ قَوْلُ الزُّورِ وَالْعَمَلْ بِهِ فَلَيْسَ لِلَّهِ حَاجَ أَنْ يَدَعَ تَعَامَهُ وَالشَّرَابَ He said that whoever, give, whoever does not give up scandalizing, backbiting, and acting upon it, then Allah has no need for that person to give up their food or their drink. And so in saying this, the Prophet, peace be upon him, is telling us that there's something more to the fast. Of course, the physical part of the fast, the hunger, the thirst, our desires, this stays in the forefront of an individual. However, the stronger we get spiritually, the stronger we understand mentally what fasting is, uh, is the weaker that the animal desires get. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, is saying that the fast really is something which is spiritual thing. It's something which is more than just uh, fighting your desires, but it is something connected with your lifestyle and your habits. So it's something greater than this. Because otherwise, we would fall into the categories of IMSAC <clears throat> that people in all walks of society are involved in. Imsak, in a sense, in Arabic, literally, you look at the Arabic term, it is abstinence. It's to avoid, to stay away from something. And imsak, literally, you're grabbing it, but you're literally taking control uh, of yourself to avoid other things. Of course, when we talk about som, then we are talking about imsak, a special type of imsak, from dawn all the way to sunset because people are involved in imsak for a number of different reasons. There are those who do imsak for health reasons, especially within developed societies in the past uh, century or so. People have become allergic to many things, things which in ancient societies people were not allergic to, but because of the chemical usage and because of the lifestyle it now becomes uh, a dangerous thing for a person to come in contact with certain items, smells, uh, or certain environments. So for instance, there are people who are allergic to nuts, to peanuts. And they are told, read the labels. So you have to look and make sure there are no nuts in anything uh, that you are eating or around. If there is, if you find it, imsak. You have to abstain. If you don't abstain, then a reaction will come out of the body. There are some people who are allergic to dogs and cats. They can tell immediately if a dog or a cat is in the area because of the hairs, and so they need to be in a hair-free environment. And if they smell it or feel it, they abstain. There are others, because of the uh, overuse of sugar and the society we live in today 
have developed uh, diabetes, and so they are told by their doctors, do a form of MSAC, that you have to avoid sugary things, and you literally have to start to read the label. So for medical reasons, we are doing MSAC. Most people have something in their life that they have to avoid in order to stay healthy. There are other people who do MSAC for social reasons. Peer pressure, especially with our lives being controlled by fashion industry and food industry. There are many people who are seriously involved or seriously committed to staying with the styles. So if the styles that are coming to them, meaning the style of dress, how you should look and how you should go to work, uh, if the style is telling the person that you should have very loose uh, pants and high platforms on your shoes. Um, when I was growing up uh, here in the Americas, um, this was one of the styles. They called bell bottoms, right, and big platform shoes. Um, and so people, everybody wore very loose clothes. But as the time went by, in order to uh, uh, maximize consumerism, the people who are controlling the industry change the pants. So you could have a pants that you could wear for the next three years because of the materials. But because of styling, it's obsolete. So you take your wide pants and you get rid of it and you buy narrow pants. The styles have now gone to another extreme in that the clothing that people are wearing is uh, uh, very tight. And in some cases, the pants and the clothing literally grips the skin. And they use this material uh, that they came up with in the 60s called spandex. And spandex revolutionized uh, clothing and fell right in line with the, the prediction of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu who said that the time would come when there would be women and, and people who would be dressed but naked. So we use this terminology, they are clothed, but they're naked. That's, that's a strange thing. I mean, he's, he's expressing what's been given to him. But with spandex, you could literally be clothed, but it is describing your body so much that it is like you don't have clothes on. So the, so the hadith then, the saying then, comes into reality. And because of this, People now, uh, especially females, young females, they strive to be very thin. And therefore, they avoid eating food. And there are some people who even develop uh, a mental disease, you could call it, anorexia, where if they eat too much, they will then throw up the food. Why is that? Because the styles the peer pressure of society is dictating to them. And so they do imsac. So they literally are involved in abstinence. There are other people who are involved in abstinence for political reasons. What is called today in many parts of the world a hunger strike. And you will find, especially in prisons, um, that there are people who will go on a hunger strike in order for their uh, message or their condition to be known by the rest of the world. They're locked away, and nobody's going to listen to them. But they organize the hunger strike, and they struggle and strive in their hunger strike. They're connected with people on the outside. The information then goes to the rest of the world, and it becomes an issue. So the issue of that prison becomes important because of imsac. So it is a form of imsac. It is a form of abstinence. And even in our own nation, we see people um, in Palestine uh, where people are trapped in the largest open air prison in the world uh, and constantly being threatened and, and imprisoned unjustly. You will find a uh, uh, hunger strike um, is growing. In Guantanamo Bay, 
uh, many of uh, our people who were unjustly trapped uh, in the international prison system and landed in Guantanamo Bay, they went on a hunger strike. In the UK, the Irish people, Irish Republican Army was known for its hunger strikes that they would go on. And when you go on a hunger strike, the people who understand hunger strike, they will come to you and they will give you lessons as to how to do the hunger strike. You can't just say, I'm on a hunger strike. They will tell you how to function and more than likely tell you, do not expend a lot of energy. Conserve your energy because you're going to need your energy so you'll have enough strength that your hunger strike will be long because the longer it is, the better it is. So there's rules. Just like we have rules around fasting, there are literally rules that you have to learn in order to be successful. And so they do imsak for political reasons. In some religion, they abstain from food, they abstain from worldly desires in order to punish themselves, to kill their desires, because they believe that if you kill your desires, then you will control uh, your lower self and you become a higher person. So they will do imsak as well. <laughs> and our fasting, our imsak, is a specialized one. It is not based on politics. It is not based on uh, fashion. It's not based on uh, medical reasons. Although if fasting is done properly, there, there could be some, there are medical benefits that can come from it. Um, there are social benefits that come from it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to us in Surah Al-Baqarah um, very clearly, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem, Ya Ayyuha Ladina Amanu, Kutiba Alaykum Usiyam, Kama Kutiba Ala Ladina Min Qablikum, La'allakum Tattakum. O you who believe fasting has been prescribed on you as it was prescribed and written on those who came before you in order that you would have taqwa. La'allakum tattaqun. And taqwa is the consciousness of Allah. Taqwa is not something that you can um, hold on to and quantify. It is a spiritual thing in a sense and it has to do with our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the muttaqi is the person then who can sense the presence of the Creator. They sense the presence of the Creator. And with that sense that they have, it helps them to make the right decision. I remember um, a number of years ago, I was in Los Angeles and I was driving on the highway um, with Sheikh Muhammad Faqih. Sheikh Muhammad Faqih has become famous this year because he was one of the group that sighted the moon in California. Do you remember the thing at the beginning of the month? Okay, so he was the main person, um, qualified person in that group who sighted the moon. So most of the masjids, when they heard Sheikh Muhammad Faqih mentioned, uh, he's Harari from Ethiopia, great scholar, great uh, uh, Qadi of the Quran. When they mentioned that he saw it, they said, okay, finished, because it was Sheikh Muhammad Faqih. I was riding with Sheikh Muhammad Faqih in Los Angeles, and we were on what they call the freeways, uh, which is like our 401. It's even worse to a certain extent. And we were on the freeways, and we went from uh, the side, and we were just about to go on to the main highway. And suddenly, I looked at uh, Sheikh Muhammad, Jazawullah khair, who is a very uh, joyful kind of person. He likes to tell jokes and, you know, he's very lively kind of, and he was stiff. And he was looking at the road. And we're going on, he's making his signal and he became very stiff. And I looked at him and I said, you know, Sheikh, what is going on, man? And he said, LAPD, Los Angeles Police Department. And when he looked into his mirror, the LAPD was right in back of him. And having that presence of the police in back of you, think about it, and you've, we've all gone through this. You're riding along and 
you know, in Toronto now, Toronto's changed. And Toronto people used to be very polite on the road. You know Toronto in the 60s, right, 70s. Very polite, not like New York or anything. Now everybody's getting aggressive in their driving. And when people see a yellow light um, in the old days, they would slow down and stop. They would go for stopping. Today, when they see the yellow light, they go faster and they go through the light, right? But if the police department, if the police, if you look in the mirror and see the police in back of you, right? What happens to you? You become a good Canadian citizen. <laughs> and you slow down nicely for your yellow light, right? And you make your stop and you look out the window and do your signal. Why? Because you feel the presence of the police. He didn't do anything to you. But because you felt his presence, think about this, and you know what will be the consequences of going through the yellow light and the police giving you a ticket, right? If you were in the United States, it might be more than a ticket. They'll probably taser you if, you've got, if, you're, if you're a person of color. And if you're a Muslim, they probably arrest you as a terrorist. But the presence of the police in back of you, right, gives you a consciousness where you want to obey the law. Now, taqwa is that consciousness not to obey Ontario law, but it is to obey the law of the creator of the heavens and the earth, the Sharia law, which governs all of our life. So taqwa is that consciousness where the person, in the same way that Sheikh Mohammed felt LAPD in back of him, right? That we would feel the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not physical as the, the police will be because Allah is in his that, in his essence, is above seven heavens. But in terms of knowledge, in terms of uh, uh, knowing what is happening, Allah is closer to us than our juggalade. So therefore, the consciousness of taqwa, think about this now, the consciousness of taqwa is that whereby you're living your life and you literally feel the presence of Allah. So that when there's an opportunity to do something good, you do it. When there's an opportunity to avoid something evil, you do it. And it, is, it grows stronger and stronger with the taqwa. So the more the taqwa that the person has is the stronger that person actually can be in terms of their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the essence of why we are fasting. That's the bottom line. It's not a political thing. It's not a social thing if we're doing it right, although for some people it's social because you know there's a social thing to it. But it's, that's not really what the fasting is supposed to be because this fasting is something which is special for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as Allah informed us through the Hadith Qudsi that the Prophet ﷺ said in describing this, that all of the actions of, of the children of Adam are for themselves except for fasting so Allah said, this is for me, and I will specially reward you for this. You're going to get a special reward. And when Allah said it's special, it's not like our special. So therefore, the fasting is something that only I know and you know if I'm really fasting. We accept the fact that we're all fasting. But technically speaking, a person could have hid in his closet and drank water and then wipe his mouth and come out like he's suffering on a hot fasting day. How do you know? But Allah Azza wa Jal knows. So therefore, this is a special act. And when it is done for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in mind and not to please other people around and not to lose weight in the month of Ramadan. Right? Not to make a hunger strike. 
when it is done for that reason, then the relationship with the Creator becomes stronger. It's a type of sincerity. It's described in other words. There are many different adjectives. One of, one of the strongest ad adjectives to describe the purity of this relationship is uh, uh, sincerity. It is ikhlas, as, as some people will say it. There's many words in Arabic. This is such an expressive language. The sincerity, the pure relationship of the servant with the creator. That's what we're looking for. And it's not something that requires a PhD or requires some special secret knowledge. No. It is something that everybody can do. And some people who are uh, uh, the, the, a simple, average person may be more sincere than a person who claims to be a leader of Islam. So that sincerity is something that we need to com seriously consider. And in the same way as our sincerity to Ontario law when the police is there, part of that sincerity is knowing the outcome. That going through the yellow light and the red light, speeding could not only cause an accident, but could also mean you lose your license or you get tased or something could happen to you on the road. So the greater picture of things so think about this consciousness now. That person who changed now is now thinking ahead of themselves, right? Breaking the law, getting the ticket, getting in trouble, losing their license. All of these things are now in front of the mind of that person. And they slow down for the yellow light. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu on one occasion was reported to have said, al kayis mandana nafsa. وَعَمِلَ لِمَا بَعْدُ الْمَوْتِ وَالْأَحْمَقُ مَنْ أَتْبَعَ نَفْسَهُ هَوَاهَا وَتَمَنَّ عَلَى اللَّهِ الْأَمَانِ So the Prophet Sallallahu said, الْكَيِّسُ مَنْ دَانَ النَّفْسَ The intelligent person, and the kayis is like a cunning, extremely intelligent person, is the one who controls himself. And he works for what is after but the ahmaq, the fool or the idiot, or a'jaz, as it comes in some uh, narrations, the, the, the unable person, the weak-minded person, the fool is the one who lets himself go and then hopes in the end everything will be okay. Every Allah kareem. Everything will be all right. They let themselves go, as Nike Air said, and many youth used to wear the shirt. Many people wore it. Said, just do it. You remember that? Just do it. What does just do it mean? Do anything. Okay, so this is a culture of let yourself go. Right? Go out of control. That's the kind of culture that it is. Right? But the culture of Islam, right, and this is the intelligent person, who knows the greater picture of things. Think about it. The fool is the one, right, who just doesn't care this short period of life. They may be in this world for only a short period of time. Maybe 20 years, 30 years, a long life in many countries, 100 years, that's a long life. The oldest people in the world, they say, they don't go over 120. Wallahu a'lam. So if you live for a hundred years, that's a long life. Okay? So your period in this dunya was a hundred years. In your mother's womb, nine months, right? Sections of life. Hundred years. When we go through the transition of death into the next life, Allah describes it, Khali Dina Fiha Abadan. They will live in the next world forever. They will live there forever. So if you look at forever, eternal life, and you divide it by a hundred, then your answer is zero. 
So the intelligent person is the one when they're in this world, they control themselves and they work toward the next life. Because our actions, the things that we do, there's positivity and negativity. Even the scientists, many scientists who don't believe in God, they will say, for every action, there's a reaction, scientific principle. For every action, there's a reaction. You might not see the reaction, right? It might be invisible to you. But for every action, there's some kind of reaction in the universe. That's how everything is. So when the person now is doing righteous things, good things, the majority of their life, they did good things, then this is the energy that they put off. They think positive. Right? They're innocent in dealing with relationships. They ask for forgiveness. They are a positive vessel of energy. Right? You explain it in scientific terms. They're a positive vessel of energy. So when the body drops off, right? Death, the body drops off. The only thing that you have left is your energy. That some call the soul, a ruh. But nobody really knows what the soul is. But for our minds, our limited minds, if, if we can use this term, that, the, that your vibration, your energy is left, right? So if you leave the world with positivity, then according to the laws of the universe, even for those who don't believe in God, your reaction, positivity. So when your soul goes into the next world, which is not a physical world like this one, it then meet, will, re, will, will get a positive reaction. If, however, well, Iyadu Billah, the person is surrounded by negativity. They lie, they steal, they cheat, they oppress people. They rebel against the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the person now is surrounded by negative energy and they leave this world, then for every action, there's a reaction. So the re the, then they will receive negativity. This has been defined for us in terms that we can understand as human beings. It has been defined for us in terms of the punishment of the grave. And in terms of on the day of judgment, our scales that there will be a kitab, there will be a book, that you will see all your actions, right? This is defined to us in a way that we can understand, right? But in an abstract form, right, we can see the positive and the negative. So the Prophet ﷺ is then saying the intelligent person controls themselves in this life. They control themselves, they take it easy, and they work toward the next life. So they work toward having a positive uh, energy, being a positive entity when they leave the world to get the positive. But the fool doesn't care. So the fool does anything. He's involved in this, involved in that, not controlling themselves. And then they hope that, that maybe I'll be okay. That's an idiot. That's a fool. What we do need is that sincerity, and that's the intelligent person who knows the greater picture of things. Remember, it's just like the person who's driving the car, for those who, who, who just came in, and they reach the yellow light, and they feel the presence of the police in back of them, Ontario PD. They feel it. So when they reach the yellow light, they slow down, and they become a good Canadian citizen. Right? If the police wasn't there, he would hit the yellow light and go right through, even if he's the second or third car on the yellow light. Now it's get three cars now. The third one wants to go through. Okay? Note, they don't care about the law. Right? So that consciousness now, that consciousness, that sincerity to Ontario law, is for the one who has the greater picture of things. That sincerity is the essence of our religion. And this is the essence of our month of Ramadan, which is going to assist us in our religion. 
And in this light, we know that Prophet Muhammad ﷺ did not speak from himself, and he gave us information that can help us in all levels that we are striving on. And in this level of sincerity, this is a crucial level for us to understand. Another format of this terminology, sincerity is the word an-nasiha, an-nasiha. And you hear the word nasiha being used where the person will say, oh, give him nasiha. Give him an advice. But it's more than this. Because nasiha uh, also means um, integrity. It can mean support. It can mean doing justice to a person or a situation. In other words, being sincere in that situation. All of this is nasiha. And nasuha, this verb, literally is used when you clean metal, you burn it. So you burn the metal, right? And then it cleans the metal. So this nasiha is also connected to this. And the Prophet ﷺ said in authentic hadith, and it is reported in different formats. In one format reported in Sahih Muslim, he is reported to have said, Adinu nasiha, kulna limen ya Rasulullah. Kala lillahi, wali rasulihi, wali kitabihi, wali amatil muslimin, wa khasatihim. Okay, so the Prophet said, Adinu nasiha, the essence of this way of life the essence of the religion itself is nasiha. That's the essence of everything. Okay? And they said, who is this nasiha for? And they said, and the Prophet ﷺ said, it's for Allah, for his messenger, for his book, for the general body of Muslims and the leaders. This is nasiha. Okay, so this is hadith in Jamia. This is hadith that brings a lot. And to unpack this, it'll take us time, maybe another session to unpack this. It's such an important tradition, especially in the month of Ramadan. But what is he saying? If we thought that the word nasiha meant advice, then the Prophet ﷺ said, your advice or your nasiha is for Allah. Can you give Allah advice? No. Okay? If it meant advice, then it would be for the messenger of Allah. Can you give the Prophet ﷺ advice? No. Okay? If it was for the book of Allah, can you give the Quran advice? No. Right? So therefore, we can see there's more to it. That's the other aspects of nasiha, sincerity, support, right, integrity. So it is integrity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right, doing justice in situations to Allah azza wa jal. You're in a situation, what would Allah want me to do in this situation? What would Allah want me to avoid in this situation. So this is the nasiha. It is that sincerity to the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. Sincerity, integrity to Rasulullah being honest and sincere, what would he have done in the situation I find myself in? What would he have done? I want to be similar to this. Okay, the book of Allah, being sincere to the book of Allah, having integrity with the Quran, not just reading it to read, right? But the Quran, as we go through this book, it is literally giving us solutions to some of the problems we are facing now, not 1400 years ago, 
some of the issues right in front of our face are being spoken about in the book and is being read to us in clear Arabic language, clearly. So therefore, with that in mind, it is crucial for us, very important for us, that we try to understand what's in the book. So when we have a chance as we go through the Quran listening to it, then take some time out right, to try to understand what's in the book. Follow it along. Go to the tafsir. Mark off certain places in the meaning. Go back to it again. Ask about it. Look it up in other tafsirs so that we will be sincere to the book. And once we find the meaning, then the sincerity to the book is to implement it. So we recite, we reflect, and we implement. We put it into our lives. Sincerity to the general body of Muslims. Now, this is something where you, you can see the, the, the different shades of meaning of sincerity. Because you can give some advice to other Muslims. But there's something else to this. There's something else to being sincere to a person. Because a young novice, a novice will just read and say, okay, I got to give advice. So that means I'll look at every Muslim, brother, uh, uh, your beard, uh, your pants are too long, brother. Uh, you you got to do the sunnah. You know, I will spend my whole day trying to find something wrong with everybody and giving them advice. Thinking that that is advice. But the same person, right, who's in trouble on the street, right, you see him in trouble and you say, well, I'm busy. No, sincerity, real sincerity, is not just the advice, and advice is good. The sincerity is coming to his assistance, coming to his assistance, right? And this is, where, this is what we need to try to understand in details. Sincerity to the leadership. And the leadership, the scholars have broken the leadership into three parts. To the umara and the ulama and the fuqara. Okay, this is one way of breaking it down. When he meant by the by, by, by the umara, these are the emirs. These are the ones who have sulta. Right? They have physical authority over you. Right? In the Muslim country, they, got, they have the gun, right? They're the ones. Here, it may be the one who turns off the light in the masjid and locks it, so you can't get in, right? So he has sultan on you, in that sense. Umara, how are we sincere to them? Next is the ulama, and these are the people of knowledge. These are the people who have studied the religion who have taken it inside themselves. Okay, how are we sincere to them? We have to be sincere to them also. And some scholars define the third part of the fuqara, meaning people who are, are, are dealing with spiritual aspects of Islam. Of course, ulama also deal with this. But there are some people in particular, if you have a problem with how many rakats I should make or some detail, you go to a certain type of person. But you might not go to that person if there's something wrong with your heart. In other words, it's not how many prayers that I made, but I, I don't feel right in my prayers. I want to improve my relationship with Allah. Then there's a certain kind of a person that you will go to uh, to get that advice. Okay, so sincerity is needed for all types of leadership, whatever the leadership may be. That sincerity is the essence of our religion. And it is the essence of the month of Ramadan, essence of everything that we are doing. It's not a political rebellion, although if it was announced openly in Toronto that 10% of the population, all Muslims are not eating and drinking all day, they would say this is a revolution. 
Maybe they say, okay, is this a form of terrorism? Could it be a group terrorism? They're terrorizing uh, our food stores because they're not eating, right? They, what people would say, well, what are they doing? How can 10% of the population not eat and not drink all the time from dawn to sunset? This is strange, okay? But it is happening, right? It is not a social thing. It is not medical. It is, as Allah Azza wa Jal told us, Ya ayyuha ladina amanu, kutiba alaykum siyam kama kutiba ala ladina min qablikum, la'allakum tattakun. O you who believe, fasting has been prescribed on you as it was prescribed on those who came before you in order that you would have taqwa, the consciousness of Allah, sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we pray that Allah Azza wa Jal would give us this sincerity and would bless us in this month and would accept our prayers and our fasting and our sadaqah and everything that we are doing uh, in this sacred month of Ramadan. May Allah bless us. May Allah protect our children and this ummah. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdika. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad. وآله وصحبه وبارك وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته